Okay, I've been told it's time, so let's get going. Um, as I expected, very small group. This is weird. It sounds like I'm talking to hundreds of people. <laughs> um, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly small room. I said before you came in that there'd be about 10 people, and we have 10, so that's good, or around about 10. Um, so I don't want to do this as a presentation style. I want to do this as a, as a discussion as to what is the state of the feather. Rather than in the past, this has been a plenary session, and Jim Jagelski has stood up and, and, and given us some stats and some some rah rah moments about the foundation over the previous year and so on. Um, I don't want to do that because it is a much smaller audience. It's not a plenary session. So I want to say here from from you um, what you think the state of the feather is. I do have some slides that I'm going to talk to and and introduce things, but I want people to interrupt, ask questions, correct things that you don't think are right, etc. Um, now, to give me an idea of what pays to go through the various sections, I just want to understand who we've got in here. So, how many people are pretty new to the foundation, um, aren't really aware of how it works and how it's structured? Yeah. Okay, about half of the room. Okay, good. Uh, how, how many people uh, are, are engaged with the foundation in some way, maybe a contributor to a project? Okay, interestingly, some of the same people who put their hands up before. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, and how many people are members of the foundation? Okay, so um, for those, those few people who are members, there's a bit of the sort of background stuff, so you can do your email or whatever, and then we'll get into discussions of, of moving forward. Okay, um, first of all, most importantly, because this is just tradition, thank you to the sponsors. I'm not going to name them, uh, but they're there. The important thing about sponsors in the foundation is that these people have no influence whatsoever over the foundation, at least not from their status as sponsors. So they give us money, and we use that money to run the foundation, but that's it. They get the occasional thank you, like now. I'm not even re reading them out for the benefit of the tape. Oh, I guess they're not using tape, oh dear. <laughs> Showing my age a little. Um, um, so they don't have any direct influence over the foundation at all. But without them, the foundation couldn't exist. We wouldn't have the resources necessary. Um, before I move on to the next slide, since we've just doubled the number of people in the room, you've managed to find this nicely hidden room at the bottom of the, uh, the area. Um, I want to make this a, a, an interactive session. Okay? I want us to, to discuss about this and, and um, decide for ourselves what the state of the feather is. It's useful for uh, board members to hear those kinds of inputs. There's two board members in the, in the room at the moment, uh, and I will also feed back to the board. Um, it's useful to hear your views on, on the kinds of things that I'm going to say here. Um, so I did a, a little round robin before. There was about half the people in the room before felt that they didn't really know much about the foundation and how it works. So of those people who just come in, if you, if you feel, put yourself in that basket, you don't really know a great deal about how the, financial, sorry, the foundation works. Uh, can you raise your hand? Just give me an idea. Okay, nobody knew, one or two knew. Um, okay. So please do interrupt, do correct anything I say, do uh, ask questions to, for clarifications on anything I say, um, or whatever. Call me a fool if you want to. I've been in the foundation a long time. I have a thick skin. I can cope with that. So why is the foundation important? Many people will tell you many different things about why it's important. One thing that we could look at is that open source actually needs foundations. A while ago, a guy called Henry Kingo um, did some evaluation of some successful open source projects, a number of them. I think there was about 30 in the study, and he picked what ones that were well-known projects that were seen as successful open source projects. One of those was an Apache project, and then there was about 29 others. And what he found was that of those projects, the nine largest, and he defined largest by the vibrancy of the community, so number of users, number of contributors, number of committers, that kind of thing, not in terms of lines of code, but in terms of health of the community. The nine largest were all governed by independent foundations. The tenth largest was an order of magnitude smaller and was governed by a commercial entity. And the conclusion he came to through all this work was ultimately, if you want to grow a vibrant community, you really have to do it within a foundation. And we'll look at why, at least in the Apache Software Foundation, why that's true. But if you are building a business around open source, he also made some useful observations about what it means to have a larger organization. If you're in a foundation, you can grow your project to 10 times the size of if you weren't in a foundation. 
That gives you 10 times the number of contributions to your project, making your project, your open source code, your product more valuable. And that in turn, that also gives you 10 times larger potential community to market to, to sell to. Now, we shouldn't be selling to the open source project, we'll talk about that later, but there are people out there who don't want to engage with the project. The larger the project, the more people out there who are wanting to buy services, buy products based on that project. So foundations are important from the health of the community and also the health of the people who are engaged in that community. The ASF is just coming up for 15 years old. I think it's, is it June or July? We, we can't remember. It, I know it begins with a J and it's 15 years this, this, this year. Um, and it's still growing and the pace of growth is, is increasing still. What we've done in the foundation is we, we have successfully created a neutral collaboration space. Within this space that we've created, the only way to gain influence is not to give us money, as we said when we opened on the sponsorship slide. That gives you no influence at all. The only way to gain influence in the foundation and in its projects is to contribute positively to the community. If you get involved with the community but try to abuse the system in some way, it only takes one person in that community to stop that happening. To hold up their hand and say, hang on a minute, that ain't going to work. As long as the community backs that one individual, then you can stop the abuse. If the community don't agree, well, that's a different thing altogether. It's probably not abuse if the community don't agree. If, however, that system breaks down, there's an escalation route up to the board who will look at the allegations and say, no, 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 you're being oversensitive or it's not really happening like that. Or very, very occasionally the board will say, you know, that's right, that's not how you run an Apache project. And the board will sort it out. That happens very, very rarely because the system works. That's why the foundation continues to grow. We have tried and tested policies and those policies are fairly few and far between. Shane. One thing about the earlier point about, one thing about the earlier point about, you know, if, if necessary, the board will step in. Um, we have a, f a poor phrase, but a phrase that the board is a blunt hammer. So you don't actually want the board to step in, right? Because if the board tries to come fix your community, we're not going to be very good at it because we're not part of your community. We're going to say, you're screwing up, we're putting in a new VP, or we're changing the PMC. That's not good. But we try very hard not to do that by having good quarterly reports and having members of the foundation be on most of our PMCs so that when this issue comes up, it gets discussed with some people who have glue and it comes up on the board list and we discuss it and we say to the project on the private PMC list, hey, this doesn't seem right, let us know what's up. Now the only time a problem comes up is when the board doesn't get an answer to that question. If the project, might take a little while, but if the project comes back saying, hey yeah, we're aware, we're working on it, great let us know in your next quarterly report, we're all set. But if we don't get an answer, or if we get a clearly combative answer, which is incredibly rare, then the board will take some action. But it's all about discussion and about having a breadth of people who have some experience of, hey, that's not quite all right, and let's think about it, let's work together, so. Absolutely, that's absolutely right, and that really is, is, is the longer version of, of my, it only takes one person to stop the abuse if there is an abuse going in there. And what we often find, actually, that when somebody is accusingly, accusing of, so when somebody is said to be abusing the system, actually they're not. They're just not understanding the impact that their actions have on the broader community. And nine times out of ten, as Shane says, people will just step back once they've understood what the issue is. They will step back and fix the problem themselves. Um, so we have these tried and tested policies, and these policies are, are very few and, f and far between. We have some very strict policies about intellectual property management. Okay, you've got to be able to license this software and have your downstream users use it according to our license. We have some uh, trademark protection activity. Thank you, Shane, who does a great job as, uh, as VP brand management. Uh, and then we have some community engagement models. We don't allow benevolent dictators, those kinds of things. There's a few policies written within those that ensure those three things are covered, but that's pretty much it. After that, the projects are allowed to do their own thing. So we, we have policies that enforce the required things for growth, 
but we let the projects get on with what they need to get on with. And you'll notice there's nothing in there about the technical aspects of the projects, and we'll come back to that later. But 15 years, still growing, successful model. But we've got to be careful not to get complacent to say that, you know, this is, this is going to work forever. Our projects are world leading, so we don't need to change anything. Our software development processes have been proven to work time and time again, so we don't need to change anything. We've got to recognize as the foundation that the Apache way is not the only way. There are plenty of others. Of those top nine, there was eight other foundations, all doing really well and having orders of magnitude larger projects. And we've got to look at our way and compare it to other people's ways and learn from them and, and do them. And that's really the discussion part. Right? I, there's people in this room who are engaged with projects that are not Apache projects. And it would be useful to have feedback, and I'm going to give later on some questions of my own um, that will hopefully uh, in, uh, inspire discussion there. So let's look at ourselves, make sure we understand what the ASF is all about. The ASF is a not-for-profit foundation, and we're all about open, collaborative software development projects. We produce software for the public free of charge. We're an independent legal entity in which individuals and companies can donate resources and be assured that those resources are going to be used to produce software for the public good. We provide a legal framework within this entity that protects individuals who contribute to our projects. So you can contribute knowing that if there should be some legal dispute around it, you are protected. You're not going to lose your house over this. We also protect the Apache brand. Now, the brand isn't about individual projects. The Apache brand is about this Apache way thing. It's about being able to grow projects successfully. It's about ensuring that we provide all these other things above on this slide. And we provide a legal and technical infrastructure and a community oversight infrastructure. So we provide the IP management, we provide the trademarks, we provide the machines for managing our version control, etc., and we provide the oversight to make sure that our collaborative development model um, is working for the projects. Put more simply, we provide a neutral place for collaboration. We, and we try to facilitate the production of high-quality open source software. That's all we exist to do. Now, you'll notice I still haven't said anything about technical issues, about how we gather requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And that's deliberate, because we don't, as a foundation, we don't do that. Individual projects do. What is what, what the ASF is not? Um, we're not a software development organization. We don't pay for any software development. As a foundation, we don't produce software. Volunteers within the foundation working within projects produce software. So the foundation itself has no input whatsoever on what is put into that software. We're not a requirements body. The projects, the volunteers within the projects do that kind of work, yes. But we, the foundation, don't. There's nobody in the foundation that can say to Project Apache Foo, you will implement this feature. That just doesn't happen. We're not a standards body. We don't create standards. We just create software. Now, it's true that many of our projects implement standards, and many of the volunteers creating that software are also engaged with standards bodies. But the foundation itself doesn't directly influence standards bodies. And we don't sell influence. I've said this point a couple of times. Sponsorship of the foundation buys you nothing but a thank you and a load of really good software that gets produced because the foundation exists. So we're growing significantly. We have this mission to produce software for the public good. How do we stay true to the mission when the number of voices within our projects is growing, the number of projects is growing, and the scale of the foundation is, is increasing? Well, we have, thanks to the people who originally set up the foundation some 15 years ago, a model that is extremely scalable. It's almost identical to what was set up in the bylaws 15 years ago. There's been a few tiny tweaks here and there. But for all, uh, in fact, 
I'm not sure that the bylaws have ever actually been changed. There was one change in 15 years. So thank you very much to those people who started it off for us. They got it right. And they got it right to the point that 15 years later, the same bylaws are allowing us to scale. So we have two parts to the foundation. We have the foundation itself, which provides us with organizational oversight. And I've talked about those um, already. The most important people within the foundation are the members. Members are people who are voted in by the other members. They come from the projects. And those members only have one right over and above people within the projects who are not members. And that's to vote for the board once a year. Actually two, vote for the board and vote for new members. Those are the only two things that the members have. The board are the people who um, once a month go through all of the board reports that Shane was talking about earlier on, deal with any issues, take all the flack from the membership because with a large membership there's many different conflicting views about how you would do something, and make sure that the foundation runs on a day-to-day -day basis. And the board also appoint officers. And the officers are typically from the membership, although that's not a requirement, um, but they typically are because those people have shown they understand the foundation. Um, and those officers are delegated tasks by the board and have authority over certain areas like brand management, like fundraising, like treasury, like uh, marketing, etc. The really important people, though, are not those people. All they do is provide this infrastructure to make everything else happen in the projects. The projects is where the software is created. In the projects, we have users, contributors, and then we have committers, people who have right access, and then on top of that, we have PMC, Project Management Committee. In some projects, those two groups are the same. In some projects, they're different. It's up to the projects as to where, how they manage that thing. The PMC elect committers and elect um, the other PMC members. It's all done through merit, and that's the secret to the scaling here. If somebody has an interest in a project sufficient that they're contributing merit, then they were brought into the management structures of first a project, then another project, and then membership, and so on. And unless you're very good at saying no, you will find yourself very quickly being brought into that members space and providing oversight over the foundation to make sure it continues to work. So the model scales extremely well. So this is the point at which we can hopefully start looking outside, and please shout out your experiences of other, other foundations as we move forward. And we've got to learn from others as well as from, in, from within. Um, those of you who are members um, may remember Greg Stein, who's been a director of the foundation for many years, asking a question some time ago um, during the board, members, board nominations. How do you, the nominees, aim to ensure that the ASF is still relevant in 50 years' time. I was unfortunate enough to be a board nominee at that time, and I had real problems answering that question for two reasons. One, it's an extremely hard question. How do I know what's going to be happening in 50 years? And two, whatever I said was going to be on public record for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, None of us, I believe none of us, had an answer. I think we all had the same difficulty. And we ask the question now quite frequently of ourselves. We revisit it regularly. Because what we think is going to look like in five years, 10 years, 50 years, changes almost every day in this environment, certainly every month. So we need to ask this question very, very frequently of ourselves. We need to come back. If we don't do that, we're not delivering on our mission, which, if you recall, is to produce software for the public good. If we're not adept, adapting to the requirements of the environment we're in, we can't do that. So, having said that, one of the biggest frustrations, Shane. So, I'll just add one, one interesting perspective. That's a really hard question to answer for one reason. A separate reason is one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand is we have projects and we have the foundation. And we all hopefully share a fair number of people who contribute to both, so we, we share culture, but fundamentally they're different things. And I've started thinking about the 50 years thing. The, I hope the Apache brand is relevant in 50 years because we offer a model for sustained collaborative um, work together. Now what that work is, I don't really care. 
as long as it's useful to someone out there. I mean, we've seen from the fact that we have all these other foundations, that we have all, all the companies trying to you know, do their own, oh, sure, it's a foundation, but the company really owns it. But they're trying to brand it that way. With software, people are going to do this kind of collaborative work together somehow. And they'll always show up if you have a decent model. So the point from the foundation's point of view is can we make our model continue? Because I know projects are always going to come to us if we are successful at showing that we can get people to work together in a productive way. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, the, average, the, the projects don't really need to worry about that. But if you are, are interested in that kind of stuff, then we want to hear from you because that's right. what we try to do is make sure the foundation is going to continue. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, I, I totally agree, but you still didn't tell us how we're going to still be relevant in 50 years. That's just why we should ask the question. It's not the answer. Give me the answer, Shane. <laughs> Shane is a board member, and he's working hard to give us the answer um, uh, by asking people in just the way that you, you, you did then. Um, it's frustrating for, for board members because, as Shane alluded to a moment ago, that many people who need change are only involved with one or two projects, and they're impacted by something that's going on within that project, and they feel it's a failing of the foundation because this, this policy is getting in their way. Um, actually, it's not necessarily a failing of the foundation because there's 148 other projects, or however many projects we're up to at the moment, and those projects are affected in a different way. And so what the board have to do is try and, and, and membership as well. Remember the board report to the membership. It's the board who actually make the decisions, but if the board make the wrong decisions, the membership vote every year to replace the board and could vote at any point during the year to replace the board. So the board is always on its toes. It's very, very difficult to um, bring together all the competing views about what change is required and come up with the right solution. Because, of course, there is no right solution for everybody, especially not as the foundation grows. So we've got to remember that not all change is good. Of course, change can be for the good. But we've got to be careful not to break the winning formula. So thanks for leading into that bullet, Shane, with saying, you know, our focus here is making sure the foundation continues to provide an environment for collaboration. That is our winning formula. And we can't change too much all at once because we may well break it. So unnecessary process that gets in the way of developing software is a bad change. How many people have got first-hand experience of the incubator? OK, lots of knowing smiles <laughs> in the room. The incubator over the years has, has in my opinion, has fallen prey to um, uh, uh, too many reactive changes to problems that have come up in individual projects. And the policies within the incubator now are so long that what happens, is, or so detailed, what happen, often happens is individuals who've got a spare afternoon and are reviewing a podling who's looking at graduation will go through the policies and say, no, this project's got a problem because of this. And because it's in the policies, it creates this huge discussion about whether this, whatever it might be, is good or bad. And you know, these projects can get crippled by the policy that's internal. Now, there's been some massive improvements in the incubator over the last couple of years. But it's still causing problems. The graduation of Stratos is under discussion at the moment. And it's causing problems within that environment because of different views about what diversity in an Apache project means. And that's getting in the way of actually producing code within that project. So we've got to be careful about that. At the same time, anything that, that removes necessary process is a problem. If we do something that's going to damage IP management, that's going to be bad for all of the projects. It's going to undermine the value of the Apache brand, which has a problem for all projects. So most of those changes in the incubator are good changes. How do we identify which are the good and which are the bad? And then multiply that up to foundation level and what the board has to deal with. That's why the board changes things slowly, very, very slowly. Although I will say in a moment, we're actually quite agile. Um, the board's job is to enforce policy as it is written today and to listen to feedback about how the policy can be improved. The board will not take proactive action to change policy unless it's clearly broken and there's something huge to think, but it isn't clearly broken because the foundation works. So if you have a problem with a, as a project member, have a problem with a specific policy, and you come to the board and say, this policy is rubbish, we're going to ignore it. Well, that's a problem. 
for the board to deal with, because you can't just ignore those policies. What you can do is ask the board to consider this alternative, which we believe will satisfy all of the conditions for the requirements of the original policy, but will solve the problem that we're facing. And as long as that is indeed replacing a good policy with another good policy, the board will be quite happy to put that in place. But don't look to the board to solve each individual problem within each individual project, because there's only nine people on the board. And there's 150 plus top level projects, all with unique problems. Come with solutions, not with problems. And then the board will be able to act. If you don't come with solutions, they'll simply stand there and say, nope, the policy says this. Okay, work with your board. Uh, okay, so here's some hard questions that I've heard over the course of the last year, and in some cases, longer than a year. Our release policies aren't appropriate, or actually the question is, are our uh, release policies appropriate for continuous deployment environments? Okay, our policies around releases were built in an era when we were, you know, core infrastructural stuff, DevOps didn't exist. You only updated, let's say, your web server, since it was the first project, every X months. So a three-day release policy wasn't a problem. But today, we're in this environment where there are some projects that their users are on continuous deployment cycles, and they want the latest and greatest code at all points. Now, some people will say, well, that's fine. If you want the latest and greatest code, use the, the SVN head or Git trunk, whatever. Use the latest code. You don't have to wait for the latest release. But some projects are saying, actually, our communities, they want the latest release. They want that to be signed off. How can we sign it off more quickly? And this is a problem that, that some projects are facing, but can't be changed just like that to solve that problem. So if you have an idea of how we can improve our release processes, please let us know. Is the trademark policy adequate? Shane, you're in charge of this. Is the trademark policy adequate? <laughs> no, I'm not, don't, don't, you're on mic. You uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question in a public <laughs> forum. I'm, the trademark policy is great and is broadly recognized as one of the best trademark policies in, in the open source environment, and that's thanks to Shane's fantastic work. But some projects will say it's not going far enough, and indeed the board recently approved uh, an increased budget for trademarks so that Shane could do even more. And we need to take a balance between becoming overly bureaucratic and then protecting the trademark. And Shane has to figure out a way of walking, well not Shane alone, but the community as represented by Shane need to figure a way of, um, of, of treading that balance. We're at ApacheCon. Can volunteers produce a valuable conference? ConCom as a committee was one of the first two committees. HTTPD, the web server, and ConCom were created when the foundation was created. And it did a great job getting 21 people, as was the case in the first, uh, first number of members, getting a small number of people together to discuss one project was relatively easy. Getting a larger number of people together to discuss 10 projects was relatively easy. Getting as many people as you possibly can together to pay for space for 150 projects, many of which are still developing their community, is a hugely complex issue. And the board, for many years, were asking ConCom to come up with a new model, and ConCom tried very, very hard. I was a member. So ConCom tried very, very hard to come up with a model, and we didn't succeed. And last year, the board killed off ConCom. This is very much a, an open question, because this conference is the first one that's been produced without burning out any ASF volunteers. It's actually been very easy to produce from an ASF perspective. Is it a good conference? Well, it's first day. Come back and tell us um, in a few days' time. Do we really need to maintain our own infrastructure? We have good reason for maintaining our own infrastructure, but the world's changed. Do we need to continue to do that? Um, there are conflicting views about that. Does the GitHub-inspired social coding model have anything to teach us? There are projects in the foundation that will say, absolutely, yes, it does. But it also causes problems for IP management, which is fundamental to the success of our projects. 
How do we manage those two conflicting things? On the next slide, some people, especially Sam, who is VP Infrastructure, will be thinking, but we've done loads of work in this space. There is credit for that work on the next slide, Sam, I promise you. <laughs> um, should the ASF be marketing its projects more aggressively? This has come up a couple of times in the last year. We don't typically market our projects. We'll respond reactively to requests that come in from the press, and we'll issue the occasional press release about a milestone release or graduation from the incubator, that kind of thing. But we don't do a lot of proactive stuff as a foundation. Projects are free to do whatever they want, but as a foundation, we don't do a great deal of proactive stuff. And some people believe we should do more. Some people believe we absolutely shouldn't do more. And I talked about the incubator earlier. The incubator is doing a great job, don't get me wrong. But can it be more efficient? Probably could. Most things can be more efficient, of course. All right, so we face a lot of issues, and I'm sure there are loads more. I'm just going to pause for a moment. Does anybody want to raise anything I didn't have on that slide that is a hot issue for you, even if you think it's just within your project? I'd like to plus one the marketing question. Um, I'm part of the CouchDB community, and um, right now any marketing that happens comes with money and people from another company, even if now they are doing it sort of as Apache CouchDB, um, working with outside programs like Influitive and Advocate Hub, and those are all bankrolled, obviously, by these interested parties, but then it's how to collaboratively contribute. Like, how do you get four companies competing on top of Hadoop to all dump marketing into marketing Hadoop. You see it at conferences. Those, that tends to work fabulously. We're having a Hadoop conference because everybody knows what the sponsorship model looks like. But yeah, more, just more talk and um, discussion on how that can work for each project and then as Apache as a whole. Um, I don't have, you know, here's how we've done it and here's how it's worked. We're only just beginning. We have a marketing list now, um, but that's mostly like, hey, here's some news. Everybody go retweet this, so. Yeah, I, and, that, and that, that, sorry, go ahead, Shane. So one, one thing, just this is a, a, a urgent plea for everybody. If you hear anybody at any of your projects talking about this, please bring it up on your lists, float the idea, even if you're not that interested in it, but you think somebody else might be. We, in the foundation side, need to hear real needs from projects. So this is kind of a thing that like, yeah, it'd be kind of great, but then sometimes we say, well, if we don't have a real need, why should we you know, have a new policy to cover this, or why should we ask our sponsors for more money so that the ASF could pay for it? If we hear from projects, hey, we really want to do this. Hey, we have a marketing list. CloudStack has their own marketing list and does a great job, but they're, of course, all from Citrix. So, you know, there's a question there. Is that okay or not? But if we, if we hear the need from the projects and from the PMCs when you're thinking about, I want to make my project successful, not your company, your project, your real need, bring it up. We need to hear about that. Absolutely, and I, I would recommend, in bringing it up, I would recommend that you first spend some time understanding why we historically don't do marketing around our projects. Get to understand that. Also spend some time understanding what the trademark policy is, because if we were to do this, the trademark policy is fundamental to ensuring that neutrality. And then, when you've understood all that, and you can understand it through discussion, we're not saying go read documents and try and read between the lines, I'm saying, don't come and say, we need to fix this, and expect a decent conversation. Come and say, we are experiencing this problem. Can you explain why we don't do marketing at this point? And listen to the answers, understand it, and then go back to your projects and come up with a proposal that addresses those concerns, but allows you to do whatever it is you need to do in your project. Okay, that would be the most productive way of bringing something to the board. The board won't come up with a proposal on its own. Okay. Individual members of the board might work within the community to try and bring something up because they have an interest. Hello, Shane. Um, but the board itself is not tasked with doing, doing this kind of thing. So, um, you know, the, the kinds of questions they have, my position on, on, on this without experiencing the pain myself personally, my position is this, well, if projects recognized marketing as a contribution and gave merit for it, maybe that would solve the problem. You know, and then the projects could come to the foundation and say, we need a budget for X, okay? Um, now, we're not gonna suddenly start paying for marketing. It's a complex issue. 
for every project asked us for a marketing budget, then it becomes a complex issue managing the finances. But there are models that we could do. There are things that we can do to make it possible. Is there anything else, Sam? How many people do marketing have to profit sell? You say that again, sorry? Question, anybody who think here who thinks we should do more marketing, how many of you have actually talked to Sally? That's a really good question. So Sally is a VP marketing. CouchDB, have you talked to Sally directly? Could I, could I just rephrase the question? How many people who are interested have emailed the press list? Okay. So that's, that's a really good question. I didn't spearhead the marketing effort. Um, I've been watching it happen. Um, I plus one the marketing list, mostly to get the chatter off of dev um, and to contain it so I could organize it in my inbox better. Um, and most of what's happened there has been, hey, here, let's retweet this. Um, again, most of the outside funding and stuff has come from other companies, and that's the question of how to do that collaboratively is huge because there's a, an account, right, with one login, and typically it's a person within the team that has access to that. They'll be happy to share it, but you got to go through that guy to get it, and it's like it's not a, the Apache way, right? Um, so that guy, and we can talk about this off list, whatever, um, <clears throat> I don't know if he's talked to press. I know he's um, been in touch about trademark issues over the past years. CouchDB's kind of been run over by several buses in the last four years. And uh, most, of it, most of the interest in marketing has been to salvage the brand, not to actually like pump it. Um, it's to like get it <laughs> back out of bad, the bad press. Um, so it's mostly been reactive. But I assume um, this guy's been around for a long time. So I assume he probably did. It was Noah. He did not, I actually asked him that question. And he didn't. He yeah. Aware of it. Oh, okay. So, Interesting. Okay. okay. He's a good guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. Sure. And he, yeah, he's only got good intent, but I'll be happy to. Yeah, please do. So, so the, yeah. in ev every month, Sally, who know. is the VP marketing, says, if in her board report, says, if any projects have any marketing needs, please contact Pressa. Okay. That's one of the officers that the board have appointed. She's actually a paid contractor, so we get good response time. She's not a volunteer. We can ask her to do stuff. Um, and she is good at what she does. Um, just one observation, though, is a concrete proposal that you could put forwards with this. You were talking about the Twitter account and shared ownership. There are services out there that will, allow, that will make that easy. They're not expensive. You know, discuss it with Sally. Is it a good idea for you to have that? And if necessary, ask the, the, the board if you can have a small budget to pay for that every year. Don't know whether it's a good idea or not, but discuss it internally, talk to Sally about it, and if necessary, ask the board if they would consider that. Okay? Yes. Yeah, so since you didn't have the mic, Sam, I'll, re I'll repeat that. Um, Sa Sally is, is uh, she understands all the intricacies that we've been referring to about all these kind of things. She is an appointed officer of the foundation who is responsible for handling this kind of things. And the point Sam was making is, if Sally comes to the board and says, this project has this problem, they've proposed this solution, I think it's a good idea, that makes the board's decision an awful lot easier. So really good point, Sam. Any other people want to bring something up? I don't want to dig into specific issues, but are there any other questions we should have? I have one over here. Um, so I hang out on the incubator list, of, and I've been through the incubation process, and there's certain issues that come up again and again, particularly in the IP space. Uh -huh. And so, you know, are there things the foundation can do to help document policies reliably in a way that makes it easy for people to find these things? Because again and again, you know, the same questions come up, and yeah. Someone who's been around a long time comes and goes, oh, well, it's in this document over here. But for people newer to the foundation, they find it hard to Absolutely. discover that information. Yeah, and, and that, I think that's a, a, definitely a recognized problem. Um, most of the policies around the foundation as a whole, it's not an incubator-only problem, um, have been written by volunteers over the years. And um, you know, they're often duplicated in multiple places. They're open to interpretation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is really difficult. Um, yes, 
there is something the foundation should do. But what does the foundation do? It, it's, 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 it's kind of difficult. Do we, do we bring in somebody to document all of these things for us? Well, at that point, we get to the point that the written word becomes more important than the experience of the members. And, and so it, it's a delicate balance to be had. Um, within, once you get to top-level projects, it's a lot easier because if you're experiencing a problem, um, you only have one place to ask. You go to the board, and there are nine people on the board, and they will answer. The membership are observing and will intervene if they think the board are talking rubbish, but typically the membership have elected a board that doesn't talk rubbish. So it's easier once you're a top-level project because there's a single, <laughs> Sam's chuckling away to himself here. <laughs> Sam is a director, so he's allowed to chuckle. <laughs> um, um, so it's easier as a top-level project, but I totally agree with you. In the incubator, there are so many voices that it can be really difficult to understand which is the canonical answer. And, and that was really part of what I was alluding to earlier on. And the incubator is working through the problems, has been working through the problems. There has been significant progress uh, in, in recent years. And I, I hope we'll see continued significant progress as well. I have another one. Another question uh, relating both to marketing and to the, to the community building of the core Apache principles is uh, how about companies who want basically Apache for marketing purposes? So it's because it's difficult to establish an open source product uh, outside of foundation, so let's incubate it at Apache. And then, cool, we are the company that contributed to the FUBAR project, and we are the maximum expert. Uh, when I remember when I first joined the, with the project the Incubator, it was very important, or at least I perceived it as an important factor, that the, the community may not just be attached to one company. Uh, now, the incubator regulation, you said, got more complex, but then maybe also because of that, it got less adhered to. So for the more recent project I've seen graduating, nobody was talking about this aspect, as long as there was no visible dictator in the project community. Yeah, they know the Apache way, and so don't care about details. So, so are you saying that you feel that the importance of community diversity is, is, is being reduced? Uh, I didn't see it on your slide. And yes, that was uh, okay. my experience in the incubator. Um, I, I'm not sure I would agree with that, that, that it is being reduced. What has happened is that um, somewhere along the lines in the incubator, somebody uh, put in a metric for community diversity, which said you have to have th at least three contributors from three different organizations. And that metric was never really intended to be there in the original creation of the incubator. What, what we require is that the, pro the project is being run in a meritocratic way, so that if individuals from other organizations came along, they would be brought in. And I believe, and I only speak for myself, um, I'm not a board member at this point, I believe that it's more important to have the project graduate and be willing to bring in other people, and be active in bringing other people in, than to actually have other people. Now, if it's not willing and active in doing that, that's a problem, definitely. And for me, that's around where the conversation should be. Remember, we have board oversight um, to, to ensure that projects are being run in the Apache way. And the board members have been around for a long, long time, and they, they, uh, they recognize the patterns that come in board reports. Shane. So, so Ross has the, the feeling exactly right, but I'll restate it in fundamentally, this is a brand issue. Um, that's going to be my mem for the week. So fundamentally, the, the metric is a great idea, but then we argue about it and you, know, you don't actually have three different... That's not actually the point. The point is that the project is viewed as being managed independently. So it, that when other corporations or other independent consultants or whoever look at the project, they say, well, yeah, so-and-so started it, but it's at Apache now. If I show up, they will value my contributions and I can join if I show merit and they'll respect me. So the Apache brand is there to ensure that that is able to happen. Because if you don't have that, that appearance externally, which is very hard to define, obviously, then those other people will just not bother to show up. 
So that's a critical part of the Apache brand. And the other one is then, obviously, the then true willingness of the existing PMC to welcome those new contributors. And that is a, that is a clear metric. There's, there's no metric, no one person per year, but that is a clear way that the board and other members who watch can see, you know, you haven't elected anybody new. Uh, you really need to think about that. So one other concept has been, you know, maybe a best practice, not a rule, best practice for, for projects is, you know, focus on one new PMC member a year, just as a general growth metric, just an idea. But the point is the appearance of things. Sam wants to follow up too. Apache Derby graduated in 2005. That is a good ways back. I mean, you said that things have been changing. Apache Derby at the time, it basically was completely IBM. Uh, it graduated despite the metrics that he was talking about. Those metrics were only meant to be a rule of thumb. Things that are, do not meet those metrics need to be looked at a little closer. If you already meet those metrics, you don't have to look any further. But if it's completely, in this case it was IBM, I happen to work for IBM by the way. Uh, if it's completely IBM and it feels like it's owned and operated by IBM, that's bad. That hurts our trademarks, that hurts, etc. cetera. Uh, but if it's operated like an open community, it can graduate and we got a history back, at least as I said, to 2005 of doing that. Okay, so we, we have less than five minutes left. I, I just want to give some credit because I've been focusing on the problems and I want to focus on where we've had some significant progress in areas like this over the years, just very quickly because in a volunteer organization, when volunteers feel underappreciated, they walk away. So we don't want anybody walking away feeling underappreciated. We are, as a foundation, a relatively agile organization. It might not feel like it when you're butting up against one of these policies. It's causing a problem for you personally. But when you look at how much the, the foundation changes and adapts to the needs of its projects, there's significant work behind all of that. And we move relatively quickly. So for example, in recent times, we've done, or the infrastructure team specifically, along with lots of volunteers helping them, have done a lot of integration of Git into our workflows. And increasingly of GitHub. So one of the questions was about the social coding model. Nobody said Git and GitHub are not a good idea, despite what some bloggers might say or some Twitter feed might say. Internally, we've always said, yeah, there's stuff to be learned here. How do we bring together our values and the, the emerging values from these other technologies and social cultures? Wow, throwing light bulbs at us. Um, and that's now in place. There are lots of projects that use Git. There are lots of projects that can respond directly to Git, uh, GitHub pull requests. And this social coding model is becoming part of the ASF. But how far do we go is the question now. Um, we've invested, as I mentioned earlier on, in trademark measures, invested significantly, both in Shane's time and David Nally, who's not in the room, but David Nally has put a lot of time into that area as well. But also now um, with legal advice and with legal um, activities around trademarks. Um, I mentioned with disbanded ConCon. That was a huge decision for, to take. We could have killed ApacheCon by doing that. Fortunately, ApacheCon is carrying on, at least in the format that it previously did. Um, we've reduced our, volunteer, our, our reliance on volunteers in areas that, as the foundation grows, become more cumbersome but aren't directly producing code. For example, fundraising. We have a lot more sponsors now than we had 10 years ago, five years ago, et cetera, and somebody needs to look after that, make sure they get invoiced, manage the relationship, all that kind of thing. And it was getting to the point of being a full-time job. Today, I'm pleased to report that actually the VP of uh, fundraising recently reported in his board report that it's a matter of oversight now and that we have paid contractors doing the essential work. So our volunteers aren't burnt out running the foundation, they can still code. And there's lots, lots more. If anybody in the room has done important stuff over the last year, which is everybody in this room, uh, apologies for not having it on the slides. Okay, so it was all about you. So I started, I started with, I've just been told to stop, so I will. I started with a thank you to the sponsors, but I want to end with a thank you to the much more important people, and that's, that's you, and thanks for the feedback in this session as well. Do remember what uh, the directors in the room have said. Talk to your board, provide alternatives, etc. Feel free to approach me 
if you want to do that or you don't know who to talk to, Sally for marketing, Shane for brand management, etc. I'll point you in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.